Hello everyone, and this is lecture 43 of this series on fluids, electrolytes, and acid-base disorders. This series accompanies and expands on my book, Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Base Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I am Dr. Mohamed Tinawi, and I am a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. You can find my book on Amazon. Please click on the link below. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to this channel. We are still on Chapter 6, Hypocalcemia and Hypercalcemia. Today we are going to start our discussion of hypercalcemia. What is the definition of hypercalcemia? Hypercalcemia is serum calcium over 10.4 mg per deciliter or 2.6 mmol per liter, and it can be mild, 10.5 to 11.9, or moderate, 12 to 13.9, or severe. Severe hypercalcemia is also called hypercalcemic crisis, and it's calcium over 14, equal or over 14 mg per deciliter. Now, patients with mild hypercalcemia are often asymptomatic, the same way patients with mild hypocalcemia are often asymptomatic. Actually, patients with mild anything are often asymptomatic, hyponatremia, hyponatremia, hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, etc. Now, the symptoms of hypercalcemia, again, like with other electrolyte disorders, are nonspecific and can overlap with other things. So it depends on the severity and rapidity of hypercalcemia. These symptoms, again, nonspecific, fatigue, weakness, anxiety, increased sleepiness, and uh, if hypercalcemia is more severe, you can get nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, even constipation. Renal manifestations are important. You can get polyuria, kidney stones, and nephrocalcinosis. Obviously, you need chronic hypercalcemia to get kidney stones and nephrocalcinosis. Now, other manifestations include bone pain, headaches, hypertension, shortened QT interval. Remember, in hypocalcemia, we talked about long QT interval. Now, in extreme cases, you can get stupor and coma. In severe hypercalcemia, many times I see altered mental status, so metabolic encephalopathy. Remember that severe acute hypercalcemia can cause acute kidney injury. Why? Because we get dehydration. We get nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Remember, you get nephrogenic DI in hypokalemia and hypercalcemia. Please remember that. You can also get cardiac arrhythmias with hypercalcemia. Some people like mnemonics, stones, bones, abdominal moans, and psychic groans to remember the manifestations of hypercalcemia. So you could get kidney stones, bone pain, abdominal pain, and psychiatric manifestations. What can cause hypercalcemia? Okay, most of the times hypercalcemia is due to enhanced bone resorption but it can be due to increased intestinal absorption or decreased renal excretion. Now, the most important causes of hypercalcemia are primary hyperparathyroidism and malignancy. Okay, you have to exclude these two right off the bat, primary hyperparathyroidism and malignancy. Now, in ambulatory patients, especially when you have mild hypercalcemia, someone with not that many symptoms, maybe osteoporosis, maybe kidney stones, think of primary hyperparathyroidism. If you see someone in the hospital with severe hypercalcemia, it is malignancy until proven otherwise. And when you have hypercalcemia in the course of a malignancy, the prognosis is usually poor. So first and foremost, rule out primary hyperpara and malignancy. Now, sometimes hypercalcemia can be a clue to an occult malignancy. Sometimes you see that before the diagnosis of a malignancy. Hypercalcemia in cancer patients is common. It can be seen in up to 30%. Now, like I said, primary hyperparathyroidism and malignancy are the most two important causes of hypercalcemia. They are responsible for 80 to 90% of cases. Now, Malignancy-associated hypercalcemia can be severe and life-threatening, and it can be either due to bone lytic lesions, due to osteolytic bone metastases, or due to humoral reasons. Now, 
Humoral hypercalcemia of malignancy is common, so 80% of hypercalcemia due to malignancy falls into this category. And here we have something called parathyroid hormone-related protein, used to be called parathyroid hormone-related peptide, at any rate, PTHRP. What, what does it do? It enhances osteoclastic activity, as you would see in renal cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma of the ovaries, adenocarcinoma of the breast, squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, esophagus, and cervix. So you have increased osteoclastic activity, and the effect of PTHRP is the same like PTH on target cells. So you are going to have release of calcium from the bones. Both hormones actually have a common receptor. Let's talk now for a minute about familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, or FHH. This condition should be differentiated from primary hyperparathyroidism because FHH does not require surgery, while primary hyperparathyroidism usually requires surgery, removal of adenoma. What causes FHH? Here we have inactivating mutations in the calcium sensing receptor. So these mutations can give you neonatal severe hyperparathyroidism if they are homozygous, or FHH, familiar hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, if they are heterozygous. Okay, when you have inactivating mutations of the calcium sensing receptors, you are going to have the same effect like PTH, parathyroid hormone. So you are going to have the same effects like having an elevated PTH. Okay, this is why it can be confused with primary hyperparathyroidism. This FHH is an autosomal dominant disorder. So if you suspect it, it, you can test other family members and find the same thing. You have moderate hypercalcemia, never severe. So if you get someone in the hospital with a calcium of 15, FHH is really not in the differential diagnosis. Look for a malignancy. Here you have mild hypercalcemia, maybe 11, 10.8, 11.1, okay? The patient will have either normal or moderately high PTH. So normal PTH is what? Up to like 50. PTH here can be 45, maybe 60. You have hypophosphatemia because you have, again, a little bit elevated PTH and PTH is phosphaturic. You have hypermagnesemia and you don't have, again, severe symptomatic hypercalcemia. Milk alkali syndrome. Now, this is important. We still see it occasionally. Now, a better name for it nowadays is calcium alkali syndrome. Here you have increased intestinal absorption of calcium. So with primary hyperparathyroidism, with malignancy, you have increased bone resorption. So you have release of calcium from bone. Here, this is different. You have increased intestinal absorption of calcium due to high intake of calcium and vitamin D, especially in people who, who take a lot of antacids. Now, the kidneys cannot excrete all that excess calcium, and patients will usually present with nephrocalcinosis. Now, in the past, people, when they had peptic ulcer disease, they did not have pentoprazole, they did not have famotidine, so they used to ingest a lot of milk. By the way, it doesn't work well for ulcers. It doesn't work at all. And milk had a lot of calcium, so they ended up with milk alkali syndrome. Now, in some patients, the source of calcium may not be immediately evident, like uh, some people take a lot of uh, nicotine substitute gums, and that has a lot of uh, elemental calcium, 94 uh, milligrams of elemental calcium uh, per piece. So uh, probably then the top three reasons of hypercalcemia when, when I'm looking at, at them uh, you have malignancy for severe hypercalcemia, primary hyperparathyroidism for ambulatory patients. Number three would be milk alkali syndrome. Okay, so if, if you see hypercalcemia, ask about people who ingest a lot of Tums, who, uh, who are on high dose vitamin D, etc. Now, um, when you cannot find the reason, well, then this is time to. Uh, look up at a table to, to look for your textbook. Um, and this uh, table is, is from my book. And let's go over these quickly. Again, PTH excess, uh, primary hyperparathyroidism can be either due to adenoma, 80% of cases, or hyperplasia, 10 15%. So here you have more than one gland uh, uh, enlarged. Men, um, 
multiple endocrine neoplasia, you see that occasionally, maybe like one case every 15 years. Uh, parathyroid carcinoma is rare. Humoral hypercalcemia of malignancy and osteolytic bone metastases are very common causes of hypercalcemia in hospitalized patients. Again, multiple myeloma, metastatic breast cancer, lung cancer, etc. Milk al alkali syndrome, I said this is number three. You have here increased intestinal absorption of calcium. Vitamin D toxicity, you see that occasionally. And uh, you just check 25-hydroxy uh, uh, vitamin D level. 125 dihydroxy D uh, is interesting. You should know about that. Um, you see that uh, the prime example is sarcoidosis. Okay, you need a gran granulomatous disorder like sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, leprosy, because these macrophages uh, make 125 dihydroxy D. So 125 dihydroxy D or calcitriol is made in the kidneys, but macrophages in uh, granulomatous disorders can make it. Immobilization is common in patients uh, hospitalized for a long time. And here again, you have mild hypercalcemia. Okay, if you see a patient with a calcium of 16, don't tell me it's due to immobilization. That's not true. Badgett's disease, um, not common. I think I still have to see a case. Thyrotoxicosis, acromegaly, pheochromocytoma, acute adrenal insufficiency. These cases, you can see hypercalcemia, but usually make the diagnosis based on other things. Thiazide diuretics actually are important. Uh, they can cause mild hypercalcemia. I see that a lot. And usually you don't do, need to do anything about it. Actually, it may help in patients with isoporosis. And again, it is mild and you still need to exclude uh, primary hyperparathyroidism. Lithium can do it. Um, uh, Hyperalimentation solutions if you're putting a lot of calcium theophylline. Now, teriparatide is recombinant human PTH. So here you are giving PTH for osteoporosis and it can raise calcium. Adynamic bone disease, this is something for a nephrologist. All nephrologists are familiar with it. Patients with end stage renal disease, uh, especially diabetic, uh, many of them are on peritoneal dialysis. When you give them calcium, they tend to get hypercalcemia real fast. Their bones are inactive. So that can cause also mild hypercalcemia. Excess intake of dietary calcium can give you hypercalcemia, but again, uh, the patients usually need to be in chronic kidney disease. They should be unable to handle that excess calcium. Also, you can see that in children. Vitamin A toxicity, hypervitaminosis A, I've never seen a case, but again, this is why we need these lists when, when we, we don't know we have to consult them. Inactivating mutations in the calcium sensing receptor, again, if it is... Uh, Homozygous, you get neonatal severe hyperparathyroidism. So if you are a pediatrician or a pediatric nephrologist or endocrinologist, remember that for the rest of us, us uh, uh, internists and nephrologists and endocrinologists, we're going to remember familial hypercalciuric hypercalcemia. And we want to, again, differentiate that from primary hyperparathyroidism. And uh, last but not least, hypercalcemia of pregnancy. This is not common, and believe it or not, it, it is due to production of PTHRP. Also, I still have to uh, see a case. I, I haven't yet. Um, I'm going to end here, and in the next lecture, we are going to continue our discussion of uh, hypercalcemia. See you then.